Welcome, welcome ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jan Zopf. I'm the head of media at the World Economic Forum. Welcome to this press conference where we're gonna launch the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report 2024 in collaboration with Marsh McLennan and Zurich Insurance Group. I am uh, here joined by our panelists. We're gonna share the findings of this year's report. I have uh, with me Sadia Sahidi, who is the Managing Director of the World Economic Forum. Um, Carolina Clint is with us, Chief Commercial Officer of Marsh McLennan. And we have also John Scott, Head of Sustainability Risk at Zurich Insurance. We're gonna kick off with an introduction from Sadia and uh, we will again go um, into some specific topics uh, and in a second part of this press conference we're gonna go into a Q&A. Sadia, please. Thank you, Jan, um, and thanks to everyone who's joining us here. Um, first of all, thanks very much to our partners for the long-standing collaboration um, on this report. Um, and it really is derived out of nearly two decades of very rich data and of serving people around the world. This year we had nearly 1,500 experts from across business, government, civil society, academics and others that responded um, to the questions. We also refreshed to some extent the list of risks this year so that it is more apt for what is happening and unfolding today. And I think you can really start to see that coming out in the various um, results. I think as we enter 2024, um, fairly pessimistic outlook. So in terms of the overall outlook for the next two years and the next 10 years, we see that there's a progressive worsening of that outlook. So for example, um, there's about half of the people that were surveyed felt that in the next two years, we're sort of on the precipice of um, fairly severe risks. And another 30% that felt that we were on the precipice of catastrophic risks potentially unfolding. And when you look at 10 years out, um, that 30% grows, that that grows to nearly 60%. So two thirds of the people are expecting that the outlook is incredibly negative in 10 years time. And that is to some extent, not quite the full reverse, but quite different from last year, where in the longer term, there was still optimism. Whereas this year in the longer term, there is pessimism. Um, we also this year looked a bit differently at some of the things that in the past we have continued to examine as part of the risks list. This time we're actually thinking of them as longer term structural forces that are unfolding. So for example, we're no longer looking at climate change as one of the risks. We are now looking at climate change as one of the structural forces that is already unfolding and within which the rest of the risks need to be analyzed. Um, similarly with geostrategic shifts, similarly with demographic changes, so aging societies in many parts of the global north, very young societies in many parts of the global south. Um, so those are the, and of course, technological acceleration. So we see all of that as part of the background and then look at more specific um, risks. So within that list of more specific risks, um, we have in the two-year time frame, mis and disinformation as the number one risk, um, followed by extreme weather, followed by societal polarization, um, interstate armed conflict. That's the top five in the two-year outlook. Um, very closely followed by lack of economic opportunity, inflation, involuntary migration, and um, economic downturn and pollution. So a mix across all five types of risks, but very much driven by these concerns around what's happening in our societies um, due to mis- and disinformation. Now, in that said, in the 10-year outlook, we are looking very much at climate-related risks as still the number one concern. So, top extreme weather, second concern around critical change to Earth systems. This is a new risk, and it comes in at number two in the 10-year time frame followed by natural um, resource shortages, and then again, the continued risk of mis- and disinformation at number five, so still remaining within the top 10. 
Perhaps one final uh, piece around the, the outlook in the report or the high-level overview in the report. Risks like the adverse impact of artificial intelligence are fairly low down in the um, two-year outlook. So that's where we're seeing that as uh, number 29 out of the 34 risks in the two-year outlook, but it jumps up to number six in 10 years' time. So deep concern around the short-term crises that are absorbing leadership today um, simply not leading to the kind of planning that can deal with some of these longer-term risks and things like artificial intelligence um, or the adverse impact of artificial intelligence jumping up into the top 10. I'll pause there and happy to share more later. Thank you very much, Sadia. Carolina, are you going to talk a little bit about um, AI, disinformation, um, but also global supply chains? Yes, Carolina, thank you, please. Jan. In my conversations with the companies, two issues uh, consistently come up as current key uh, concerns. And it's the impact of artificial intelligence and it is supply chain challenges. That's what companies are concerned about right now. And these are also notable risks highlighted in this year's Global Risks Report. AI-generated misinformation, cyber attacks and cyber insecurity have emerged uh, as top risks across all time horizons. And it's about time, if I may say so, because these risks have not been prominently featured in past years, which I think is surprising given our dependency on technology, but also the acceleration of digitization following the pandemic. And given the sudden accessibility of user-friendly interfaces like ChatGPT or larger scale AI models or synthetic content to manipulate public opinion, it's no wonder that misinformation and disinformation is ranked as a top risk uh, short term. The potential impact on elections worldwide over the next two years is significant, and that could lead to elected governments' legitimacy being put in question. And this, in turn, could, of course, threaten democratic processes, lead to further social polarization, riots, strikes, or even intrastate violence. The use of AI comes with so many fantastic opportunities, but businesses have to also consider the societal, economic, and security implications of using AI. And the success of this will depend on regular testing, updating, verification, and lots of upskilling and training. It's the only way that we can prevent strategic and tactical miscalculations by AI that could lead to catastrophic errors, reputational harm, or even significant liabilities. We also have to realize that these advances, to provide, uh, these advances provide cyber criminals with new tools and pathways to exploit. In fact, you don't even have to be smart nowadays in order to be a successful cyber criminal. AI can create advanced malware, it can impersonate others for scams, it can poison AI training data, which is a very serious concern. But on the other hand, the good news is that AI can also be used to for a better response to cyber attacks. It can process vast amounts of, of data, detecting patterns that humans may overlook. And AI can also automate many security processes, such as patch management to fix bugs and close security holes. But we have to recognize the fact that everything we use, such as water, electricity, the financial system, the communication systems, all of this is dependent on the integrity of incredibly complex networked computer systems. So cybersecurity is not about protecting a computer or protecting a file. It's actually more about making sure supply chains work and that society as a whole is up and running. So at this pivotal moment in, in the technological revolution, businesses have to take a very proactive approach to assess vulnerabilities, stay informed about regulatory developments and implement robust cybersecurity and risk mitigation measures. But let's switch gears and talk a little bit about supply chains instead. Two of the highest ranked short-term risks in this year's Global Risk Report relate to climate change and geopolitics, both of which uh, impact global supply chains. Halfway through last year, supply chains looked as if they started to stabilize after the pandemic and where companies had made shifts from a just-in-time strategy to a just-in-case strategy, we saw a more balanced approach develop. So we saw less stockpiling, smaller inventories, and companies relying more on supply chain's ability to deliver. And then suddenly the world changed again. 
So the attacks on container ships in the Red Sea has made passage through the Suez Canal both <coughs> risky and very dangerous. And at the same time, on the other side of the world, um, the impact of climate change and lack of rainfall has made passage through the Panama Canal really difficult because capacity has been significantly reduced. And that means that it's a total crunch for companies trying to move goods around the world now. And diverting container ships to avoid the Suez and Panama Canals is costly and it adds time. And with the price increases to offset these increased cost of shipping, of course, we may well spark another round of inflation. So businesses must again turn their focus on stress testing their supply chain investments and growth strategies against these potential new disruption scenarios, because it's the only way that they can strike that balance between just in time and just in case. There are so many conflicting areas in need of attention and the current risk landscape, it is like looking down in a big bowl of spaghetti Everything is interconnected. If you pull one strand, everything starts moving around and it's not easy to figure out where to start to untangle this mess. As humans, we are wired to look at what is exactly right in front of us, but we have to find a better way of balancing the short-term view of risk with the longer-term view of risk. We're entering into a new era of risk now, and it's time to be a little bit more creative and collaborative in our approach to building resilience. Because only by working together, only by working together, we can reduce uncertainty, improve risk investment decision making and responses, and build that long term resilience on a global scale. So it's time now that we start thinking about collaboration, resilience, and how to address these risks for the common good. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. John, you're going to develop a little bit further risk mitigation, global risk mitigation. Great, thanks. And, uh, you know, as we've seen the, from uh, Sadia and Carolina, the, the global risk landscape is complex and fast moving at the moment. And there's some new risks, uh, the ones like uh, artificial intelligence uh, and misinformation and disinformation, largely in the tech domain. But there's also some rapidly developing risks, which are more in the geopolitical arena. So we see new wars, new conflicts. And in the past, we've used uh, global collaboration or co global cooperation, really, uh, at an international level to address, it was the main tool to address global risks. But that's really largely ineffective in today's fragmented and in-flux world. So what's the good news? The good news is there are other ways of managing global risks. And in fact, we've been using them for quite some time. And they're really about local strategies, about international approaches, about collaboration, uh, and about international cooperation. So let me take the, the first one with local uh, strategies. So it turns out that if you look at something like climate change and the physical consequences of climate change, uh, the things like floods and windstorms, uh, droughts and wildfires, the things actually my industry spend a lot of time uh, resolving in, with insurance, uh, these things are best dress, addressed at a local level. So if you think about flood resilience, for example, uh, trying to build resilience to flood, people build flood defences, for example, trying to move water away from populated areas. We try and put in things like early warning systems to give uh, vulnerable populations at risk of flood a time to move away from the flood and save themselves and save lives. You know, these, these things are all intensely local actions, and it's true for a lot of global risks that it's the local actions that solve a lot, of, uh, a lot of the problems. So the other way we can do things is to work collaboratively. And, and collaboration, if I look back at recent history, you know, if we're going back into the years of the pandemic, you know, there's some really good examples of collaboration. I mean, if you think about the vaccine development that was done so rapidly, you know, compared to the 20 years of normal vaccine development, we were developing vaccines within a year. And it was really as a result of collaboration between governments and business, and, and in business in particular, the pharmaceutical sector. So governments bringing their, their strengths in terms of uh, rapid uh, uh, approval, regulatory approval of new vaccines, uh, bringing their finance capability, and also bringing the ability to do mass distribution of vaccines once they were developed. And of course, in the business sector, you know, bringing the innovation and product development skills uh, to really bring these new products, uh, new vaccines uh, forward in a, in a very quick time. So working together, creating a really good outcome, enabling the lockdowns, the economic lockdowns to be stopped, 
uh, and to get us all back into work again. And then I think of another great one, which is of collaboration, which is close to my heart, actually, is around climate change. Back in 1998, uh, uh, the World Meteorological Organization and the uh, United Nations Environment Program collaborated together to create uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. Now, the IPCC, what they did amazingly was bring together climate science, which had, until that time had been quite disparate, uh, and to bring it together with open source data, which provided a compelling foundation, which actually led to the Paris Agreement in 2015 at COP21. And then about four years later in 2019, actually came out with this uh, 1.5 degree threshold of, of uh, global warming, beyond which uh, irreversible, ir irreversible uh, transition uh, points uh, uh, or tipping points uh, happen. So I think the IPCC and, and the vaccine development are great examples of collaboration. We can do lots more of that. Another really interesting uh, approach is individual uh, and collective action. Now, I know it's the new year, and probably a lot of you have already made New Year's resolutions. Perhaps some of you have uh, changed your diet. Maybe you've moved um, away from meat. Maybe you're going to a, a lower carbon diet. Some of you may be making choices about uh, your travel for the coming year, uh, reducing your carbon footprint that way. Maybe some of you have even thought about buying an electric vehicle. You know, all of these individually are just drops in the ocean, but with uh, critical mass, this really starts moving the needle in terms of decarbonisation. So consumer behaviour, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, risk mitigation. And of course, it's not just about consumers. Individual action can be in businesses as well. So individual companies taking a, a different approach to their supply chains, taking into account uh, uh, human rights issues, for example, can have a significant impact on reducing child labour and forced labour and removing those, uh, those things from the world. So I just want to go back to cross-border uh, cooperation uh, and, and international cooperation. And we've just had the COP28 meeting uh, at the end of last year. And for the first time, the final text agreement uh, of the meeting mentioned uh, a transition away from fossil fuel use. I think that's a really good thing. And in fact, uh, that's echoed by Fatih Birol, the CEO of the International Energy Agency, who said, look, this is good, but actually not good enough. And in fact, that's right. We need to do a lot more in terms of widening and deepening and speeding up emissions reductions around the world. So my conclusion with all of this is that uh, whilst there are many different approaches to managing risk, there's no one silver bullet. And in fact, what we need to do is pull together all these different approaches, whether they're locally, local strategies, whether it's about collaboration, whether it's about international cooperation, or whether it's about individual and collective action. But if we do all of that, we can move the needle. And I think really the, you know, the good news is that there really is in this fractured and um, uh, fast moving uh, global risk landscape that we can see, there is opportunity to address these risks uh, for all of us. But the fact is we're all going to have to take these actions. Thank you, John. Before we jump into questions, Sadia, anything you would like to add? Yeah, maybe uh, one other element that we're looking at in both time frames is what does that mean for the economic outlook um, and for the economic risks? And on the one hand, in the short term, in the last few months, it appears that we're headed towards a softer landing. It's also very clear that quite a lot of the risks that started emerging over the last year around the economy were fairly swiftly handled um, and so didn't turn into anything with very severe consequences. So there is a positive trajectory. At the same time, because of some of the geopolitical aspects, because of um, cybersecurity risks and others, it's very possible that um, there's an additional shock or a high risk of miscalculation. Um, so um, loosening policy too soon or too fast. So there's that particular aspect that we're still watching and looking through for the next two years. Inflation continues to be a top 10 risk for the next two years. In the longer term, though, um, what we're looking at is the divergence between developed and developing economies, um, as well as between 
um, those that are on a lower income trajectory and those that are on a higher income trajectory within different societies and what that means for sort of the social contract within countries over the longer term, especially if people cannot count anymore on the next generation doing better than what they are currently doing. So that's two key elements we're looking at. And we examine it in the, in the report in part through a question around could we, looking at, could we be looking at the end of development? Could we be looking at a scenario where the current level of living standards that have been achieved around various developed and developing economies, do we in some sense get frozen here because we don't have the same kind of economic international cooperation as we had before? We don't have the same kind of impetus and incentives for countries to be um, looking for um, greater growth and greater living standards in developing economies and simply not having the resources within those countries with already tighter fiscal space, facing the highest impact of climate change, um, and in addition to that, not having the same kind of access to technology and to green technology that could be boosting the possibilities and opportunities for their populations. So that's one key area that we're looking at, that longer-term divergence between developing and developed economies. Thank you very much, Tanya. So we have now time for questions. Um, so when we go uh, to you for questions, if you could please introduce yourself and tell us from which uh, media organization you are and then address your question. So we start maybe from the back here. Hello, uh, Larry Elliott of The Guardian. Uh, two questions. One, um, given that the soft landing scenario looks a bit more likely than it did a year ago, what do you account for the, the the changing mood from optimism to pessimism over the last 12 months? It seems a bit strange in, the, in that context. And the second question is, is, how severe is the risk of elections this year? We've got crucial elections coming up in the UK, India. Uh, how, how seriously should we take the risk that these elections are going to be disrupted by disinformation and misinformation. Thank you very much, Larry. I, I think the first question, Sadia, um, if you want to take that, and then maybe uh, Carolina, we, we, we talk about the election. I can, I can kick that off. I, I think, in a nutshell, it's because economic hardship is still very high. So we might be starting to control inflation, but it still means that prices are a lot higher than they were, let's say, a year ago or two years ago. So there continues to be economic hardship, and then combine that with now um, increasing interest rates, while the largest economies and the largest uh, companies might be fairly insulated from the impact of that, um, smaller businesses are not, um, mortgages are not, and so we're starting to feel that bite. And I think that economic hardship is contributing to that gloomier outlook. It's not the only reason by any means, but I think that's one of the reasons that you have that gloomier outlook. And I'm happy to get into the second question too, but maybe you want to go first. I can make a brief yes. comment. I, yes, it is, a, it is a significant risk and something that we need to watch carefully. And I think the accessibility to large-scale AI models has made it so much easier to reach a large population of voters, to also create content that looks and feels real, even though it is not. And I think it is the reason that we see disinformation and misinformation being ranked as the top risk short term. Because I, th I think there's a level of awareness, but I'm not really sure we know how to uh, get our arms around this and how to combat it. Sorry, yeah. Elections, disinformation. Yeah, so I think the results speak for themselves. People are deeply concerned. It's the, number, it's the first time we've had that risk um, explicitly spelled out in the report, and it has jumped to number one in the two-year time frame. And it's number two in the 2024 time frame. And in the next two years, because such a large part of the world is going to be voting, whether it's national elections, local elections, um, it is a risk that has to be taken seriously. And because the speed with which some of that synthetic content can be created and the fact that it is not tagged or watermarked in many parts of the world and combine that with the fact that most people are not 
um, uh, educated at present as to the risks of some of that uh, synthetically generated mis- and disinformation. Um, together, that's a very potent mix. And throw that on top of a situation where there are already a lot of economic grievances and other things, you're looking at a very difficult combination going into elections. Thank you. We had a question here in the middle. Uh, one, okay, we start. We come to you right after. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Hello. Um, please. Uh, th thanks for allowing me to ask a question. Um, can, I, can I just... Uh, Ask a bit more. Uh, sorry, it's John Paul Ford Rojas from the Daily Mail. Um, can I just ask a bit more about the quite apocalyptic scenario you mentioned earlier about the um, uh, risks of AI-driven misinformation potentially causing riots, strikes, and even violence? Can you just unpack a bit about what you mean by that in terms of how that unfolds? Are we talking about things like deep fake videos that show a candidate doing something that they didn't really do? Uh, and, that and that presumably causing an election result, a close election result, to go one way rather than the other, and then how you, you think that might end up resulting in legitimacy uh, being questioned. If you could sort of expand on, on, how, on what you mean by, by that, please. Carolina, what's yes, part of sure. your... I think you can imagine a whole plethora of scenarios, and I think you're on the right track. I mean, it could be... Uh, you know, video content, podcast material, it could be anything that you could possibly imagine. And to Sadia's point, putting that on top of already uh, some years of economic hardship, the fact that the pandemic actually redraws so many of our institutional, uh, the way we think about things, healthcare, workforce planning, everything is changing. And now there's another wave of changes coming on top of that economic hardship and maybe some limited uh, progress being made in a way that when a government is elected and you have that um, situation where you can start questioning, you have societal polarization really being exacerbated by that, will, which will create polarization and it will create a dynamic that is not necessarily prone for peace. <laughs> and collaboration. It's, it is a very dangerous mix. And maybe just adding one additional sentence to that. Um, and also then, how do, for example, governments react? Um, yeah. What is the space for them to act on? You want to protect free speech in many parts mm -hmm. of the world. On the other hand, there's also um, those governments that perhaps could overcorrect and could be seen as being repressive or could actually be using that in that way. So there's also a concern around what happens next and how is it that authorities and others react to some of those risks of risk, myths and disinformation. Okay, next question. Can, can you come here, please, in the middle on this side? No, one right, one below, and then we come, we come to the next gentleman. Thank you. Hi, I'm Laurie Gehring from the Thompson Reuters Foundation. I, I was curious um, to ask John about, he's pointed to how collaboration can help us on uh, climate change, which is something that I work on. But we, we have now had a situation where we've had the Paris Agreement, we've had this uh, agreement to walk away from fossil fuels, but we've seen immediately in the wake of that a whole round of oil and gas um, auctions around the world. And, and it's clear that whatever cooperation we're having is way behind the speed of the risks. So how, how do you see coll real collaboration that keeps up with the pace of the risks happening given everything else that we're talking about here on climate change. And I wanted to ask as well, um, both Carolina and Sadio, we, this is a poll of some of the most powerful and smart people in the world, right? And, and yet, they're the ones with the, their hands on the reins of power, and we're, they still feel that we are going down a very, very bad path in the long term. How do you turn that around? And, and why is that turnaround not happening, given that we recognize this problem? So let, let, me, let me start off on that one. So, so I think it's just a reality that the world just doesn't get organized by international cooperation anymore. You know, it's, it's fragmented, it's um, uh, in flux. But for a long time, and if you go back to the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement wasn't a, a, a global agreement as such. It was essentially the G20 nations saying, look, we'll, we'll determine our own reduction approaches. And, and that's what it is. 
Uh, and, and I think when we have these texts from the COP uh, process, that they're important because they send strong signals. And, and there are actions that have come out of it, especially in terms of uh, financing or funding the transition and now more, more prominently adaptation to climate change. So the two kind of go hand in hand. But I think the reality is, is that these actions have to happen in individual countries and locally. You know, as I, as I talked about in my, my intervention earlier, it, it's not just all about global cooperation and agreements. It's got to disintegrate into work. You know, something actually has to be done locally. If you look around your own communities, you know, what's happening? You know, how resilient are you to the physical consequences of climate risk? Uh, are you still in a flood prone area? Or is your local authority helping to, to, to move the flood waters somewhere else? And, and then, you know, what's happening with, you know, are you seeing more solar panels on the roof? You know, are you doing that as part of, you know, we talked about the cost of living crisis. You know, some people's, most people's electricity bills are so high that they're, they're, they're desperate to, to find some way of getting off the grid or, or removing themselves from the, the cost of purchasing electricity. So I think it's these kind of things that, you know, it gives us some hope and optimism, actually, that we can deal with some of these, uh, these global risks when we see the global uh, cooperation uh, at an international level not really working so well. So the second part of the question, how do we turn that around? I mean, you say there is some hope and, and optimism. Um, maybe, maybe something around just the, the starting premise of your, of your question. Absolutely, these are some of the top experts around the world. But the way we frame the questions is really asking them to analyze from a list of risks um, what may be happening in terms of the likelihood and the severity of those risks. So it's framed within that context, and that's where we find this. So it's an, an assessment of how those risks may unfold rather than forecasts. Now, that said, a lot of these things carry with them the exact solution as well. So for example, is there a risk of artificial intelligence creating some of the problems we've just discussed or having other adverse impacts that we can't right now predict? Yes. But at the same time, do we think that artificial intelligence can create a lot of economic productivity and most importantly, um, help with basic services such as education or health or care or other forms of social infrastructure? Absolutely yes as well. And so it really is about the decision making that happens today to use some of these things much more for the positive. You know, maybe another example building off of what John said, it relates to the possibility of a green transition, um, lowering prices and improving standards of living for many people beyond, of course, the very important impact that it needs to have on preserving our planet. So much of this can be turned around. It's about finding the coalitions and the decision making today and the mental bandwidth today for decision makers to actually think about what that medium to long term turnaround is. Carolina, anything to add? Yes, I think the last year's poly crisis mode where governments and businesses were really forced to, to focus on the, managing the crisis right in front of them, of course, prevented that long-term horizon, really thinking about the systemic risks, the, the big picture, where we really need to come together as a society to, to address these risks. And I think, for me, looking at the results of this year's uh, survey and seeing some of those risks really rise in rankings in the short term is actually quite helpful because now we are looking at environmental risks, we're looking at those cyber threats uh, also in the short term and then it will be easier to force conversations that are so needed in terms of how do we address this because both with cyber, with AI, misinformation, disinformation, uh, climate change, extreme weather events, all the environmental risks, not one stakeholder group can solve for this alone. The only way that we are going to be able to address this is by coming together and collaborating. And I think that cannot come as news. I think that realization has sunk in by now. Thank you. Next question, this gentleman here in the front. We have a microphone. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, Bill Goodwin, Computer Weekly. Um, Two questions. The first is on disinformation and misinformation. Could you elaborate on where you see those disinformation threats coming from? Are you talking about hostile nation states like Russia interfering with Western elections? And, and could you elaborate on that? And, and secondly, 
um, as we become more dependent on AI, we've, you know, we've seen with recent events the impact that relying on computer systems can have um, on people. What, what are the longer-term risks of becoming more reliant on AI? I can start? Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Please. <laughs> so I think it's a um, mix. I think you can see international and domestic actors looking to interfere uh, and leverage AI to, uh, to produce content that will sway public opinion and interfere with the election results. So I, I think it's a, you can see it probably coming from uh, both nation states, but also internally and domestically. Um, and the second question, you know, there are, again, I, I do want us to focus on the opportunities with AI because there, it is really amazing when, when, <laughs> when you start looking at it, the progress that we can make and how we can um, utilize it for good. But I also think it is incredibly, it's critical that we also understand that it will increase the pace of everything. We've already had a situation in the past number of years where cyber criminals had made developments really faster than our ability to imagine and come up with resolutions for how to fight back. And with AI, that is multiplying. I mean, I was looking at the uh, Bangladeshi uh, central bank heist that took place in 2016. I don't know if you remember that, but cyber criminals walked away with $81 million. They sent out 36 phishing emails to employees at the beginning of 2015. Three were clicked upon and they got into the system. It took them a year to map out the security, get past the network, how it was wired, to figure out how to do that. It took them a year. So in 2016, uh, they managed to... to um, conduct the attack. Had that been powered by AI, it would have taken two days. But on the other hand, the same is true for the response. It took months and months to try and backtrack and find, figure out what had happened and how to stop it. With AI, it could have taken a couple of days. So again, it is, we can use it for good, but it can also be used to really disrupt um, and stress, put stress on our systems. To your point, we are so dependent on technology. We are, all of us, completely rely uh, on technology today. So it will, and it can, and it will impact the way we um, can access the things that we need, for sure. John, you want to comment on that? Yeah, and well, actually, just moving on to the second part of your question about where does this go, um, I, I think for quite some time it's been clear that uh, with uh, generative AI and where that's going to go in the future, we need to think about very carefully how to, to manage that uh, at a global level. And that, that may need global agreements and uh, international cooperation to make that happen. But things like Sadia talked about watermarking content so that when you read something, you know that it's been generated artificially. That kind of thing would be really useful. And I think in the longer term, you know, technology, and it's not just information technology, but it's biotechnology and so on, all tremendously positive potentially, but have dystopian consequences as well. It's about actually managing the, uh, the, the global governance around that. And, and in some cases, it's about addressing business models in terms of data and how data is monetized. And if you think about the whole social media business model, you know, the ability to monetize um, uh, people's likes, if you, you know, the attention that people give to certain topics, I think that's an in incredibly interesting area, an important area to address, because it can no longer be the case that, that uh, there's no editorial of, of information because if we, if, we, if we carry on like that, then we end up with a world where no one is sure who to trust and what the content is that they're reading and how truthful it is. And it feels to me a little bit like even we've become like a global village. I, I almost feel like sometimes we're in the Middle Ages again. You know, somebody was walking down the street and they said, oh, I saw somebody talking to a cat. They must be a witch or a wizard or something. We should kill them. And, it, and it's almost like that level at a global level now about many, many topics. And somehow we've got to create a, a veracity, a, a, a some sort of uh, arbiter of truth that we can understand individually and collectively what is real and what isn't real. And, and I think that's where tech is going to go. And that means there's going to be more governance uh, in that space. Maybe just one quick point. I think some of this is also about um, 
all of you, um, the media industry, um, and some of the principles that can be taken forward by this group. Um, our media industry at the World Economic Forum recently put out a, a set of principles um, for how to manage mis and disinformation in this um, age of artificial intelligence. And there will be some number, number of discussions about this um, next week in, in Davos as well. And I think there's also nuance by different economies. So at the, at the back of the report, you can also see what the top five risks are for each country. And um, there you can also see what that means for different economies that will be having elections in the next couple of years, whether that's the United States or India. So for the US, it doesn't show up in the top five at all. For India, it's the number one risk, uh, mis and disinformation. So I think there's also nuance in different economies. Thank you, Sadia. Next question, go on this side. Um, here in the front, please. Hi, I'm, I'm Melissa Lawford from The Telegraph. You mentioned the risk that living standards in developed countries could become frozen. Uh, do you think they will? Uh, and what kind of time scale do you see that risk on? And then I also wanted to ask, you mentioned tighter fiscal space. How big is the risk that we see government debt distressed in developed economies? And what would that look like? Sadia, you mentioned living standards in, yeah, the, in the beginning. I'll, I'll yeah. Kick off with that. Um, I think that's uh, a concern that has been rising for some time. Um, inequality is on the rise. Um, and for some people, that means that their living standards have um, started to fall. In other parts of the world and in different societies, it can simply mean that those that have, have more, and that's why inequality is growing. So there's a lot of nuance depending on which country you're in. But what we're looking at here is the longer term trends. So for example, do, um, do some developing economies, will they receive enough finance to be able to adapt to the effects of climate change that they will be facing in the next decade while building um, in place um, energy systems that um, are greener? Um, or are we going to be looking at a, a situation where some parts of the world are asked to essentially freeze the outlook where it is, where there hasn't even been basic electrification um, for six to 700 million people in Africa. How do we ensure that that then not only happens, but happens in a way that is greener? So there's a number of trends underway that would point to the fact that we're not seeing the same level of investment in energy, in health, in education, in climate adaptation, and certainly that a lot of these governments will have to be making trade-offs um, if they do not get a lot more international support and investment. A second element is related to technology. Will these countries have the same kind of access to technology and the same kind of talent and digital skills that are going to be required so that they can then grow in a way that allows them to function in this particular global economy where they are able to be part of um, digital trade markets and digital services um, as opposed to a traditional model that would have relied on lower wages and traditional manufacturing. That's what's going to need to change and it isn't very clear that the trends are pointing in that direction. John, you want to come in? So, so I think this, this topic looks different whether you're from the global south or whether you're from the global north. I think if you look at the, from the global south, you're looking at this, you know, thinking about our structural trends uh, uh, or structural forces. The demographic structural force is a very powerful one, which plays out obviously over time. But if you're in Africa, for example, you're looking at Europe as an opportunity. And, and I know that's uncomfortable for a lot of people because it raises quite big questions about migration, which is top, top of the list of many uh, politicians and electorates uh, 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 concerns uh, coming up in the, this election year. But <clears throat> I think, you know, there's, there's a requirement with the demographics of these uh, developed northern countries where, you know, with aging populations, there's a requirement for healthcare systems, for services of all kinds, which actually the global south is quite capable of, of delivering. And I think from what Sadia said about technology, I think, you know, there's plenty of opportunities and examples of technology leapfrogging. 
uh, especially in Africa, you know, people moving away from landlines to mobile phones and mobile uh, trans uh, financial transactions very quickly over the last 20 years, quicker actually than in the global north. So actually, I think, I think you know, there isn't, it isn't all stasis. I think this is opportunity for many people. And just to pick up on your point about indebtedness at a, at a nation level, you know, we have seen historically over hundreds of years, with wars in particular, that countries and nations uh, become indebted, and it takes a long time for that debt to play out. And in fact, that's one of the, the, the big tools, is extending the tenor of the debt, um, <clears throat> the big tools for the central banks, is extending the tenor of the debt. And I think, actually, it was only in the last 10 years that the UK paid off uh, one of their last 200-year bonds related to the Napoleonic Wars. So, you know, there are, there are ways of managing uh, uh, indebtedness. I don't want to downplay it. It's obviously really important. There are short-term implications in terms of the costs of debt servicing, especially when uh, interest rates uh, are now back at a more normal rate uh, over the long run compared to what's, uh, you know, where we've been in the last uh, 15 years, really, since the great financial crisis of 2008. Thank you, John. Question here in the front, please. Thank you. Um, Michael Pesh, Ubik Media. Um, I'd like to go back to talking about how to mitigate some of these risks, um, and in particular, whether there's specific technology. Um, I'm thinking here about supply chain issues in particular. So technology such as um, advanced manufacturing, like um, additive manufacturing, industrial 3D printing, or even you know the industrial metaverse, uh, which is something we're hearing a bit about this week. What do the panel think about um, how that technology can be applied to mitigate risks, including the supply chain risk. I think there are plenty of opportunities, and it will be really interesting to see how, how this evolves. I think it's also important, though, to recognize that it's not easy to uproot uh, uproot a, a supply chain that you've built over years, where you have suppliers dependent on other suppliers, where you might be in a, um, a, a very advanced technological field where you're dependent on experts to provide support. Uh, but on the other hand, we have seen you know, elements of nearshoring and, and other activities take place in order to maybe shorten the, the supply chain and gain better control, uh, also supported in, in some cases by uh, governmental funding. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act has really pushed some of the production of semiconductors or electrical vehicles um, back stateside, for, for example. And I think we'll continue seeing that. But I also think there's great opportunities to leverage some of the technological advances to really protect and improve and um, and evaluate uh, large data sets in order to really get a good handle on what are uh, workable trade routes going forward. How, how do we manage now, if the Suez Canal and Pan Panama Canal, if those are no, go no longer going to be a viable alternatives, how do we manage this? So I think the, our imagination <laughs> is not even <laughs> you know, creative enough to imagine what we can, uh, what we can probably achieve. And, and I think, you know, there's some other things around circular economy, for example. You know, we talked last, in last year's report about finite resources. You know, we clearly are getting to a point with 8 billion people on the planet. Uh, our consumer behavior is at a stage where you can't just rely on, on finite new minerals and metals to, to build whatever it is we want. Uh, so I think uh, the circular economy starts becoming really important in terms of thinking about how to recycle. It's got a climate impact on it. We've seen, uh, for example, electrification of, uh, of steel making uh, with recycling of steel. Uh, that, that has all sorts of other interesting challenges and liabilities about product, product liability, for example, if somebody refurbishes your white goods or whatever it is, uh, is that who, who holds the liability for when it goes wrong? I think there's lots of interesting challenges, but also opportunities in that space. And there was a headline, just I, I remember now, uh, a headline where AI has been used to analyze uh, how to reduce the need for lithium in batteries, for example. Data that would have taken us decades to sift through was uh, analyzed in a couple of weeks' time. And the result points to you know, lithium need reduction of 75% or something like that. I don't remember the exact number. But I mean, those kind of advances and, and to reduce the need for precious metals or things that can be difficult to get by will also change the way we think about um, you know, raw materials and, and things that we need. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, yes, another one here in the front, please. This lady, yep. 
and we can come to the gentleman right behind you. Hi, uh, good morning, Rebecca Delaney uh, from the insurer. Uh, in light of uh, Marsh McLennan and Zurich being the partners of this report, what is it that the World Economic Forum wants to see from the insurance industry in terms of managing and mitigating these risks in the future? Thank you. I think the insurance industry is a better place to answer that question, but um, I, I think on uh, at the World Economic Forum, what we seek to do is less of an industry-specific approach, but more rather, how do different industries work together? How do governments work with business? How do civil society and experts um, communicate? For every single one of the topics that we've discussed in this report, we have a coalition or an initiative that is bringing players together from across those different sectors, from across um, different stakeholders, and that's uh, really sort of our, our method for trying to drive forward impact. But maybe you want to answer a bit more specifically from the perspective of your industry. I would be happy to. I think it's an excellent partnership in the in the way that the industry that John and I represent live and breathe risk. This is what we do. We understand risk identification, risk mitigation, risk management, risk transfer, all the different aspects of risk and resilience, which has actually really risen to the top of agendas for very senior stakeholders around the world. It is now a C-suite uh, agenda point in a way that it's not been before, because I think the realization is starting to sink in that if you don't connect risk with strategy, if you don't make that connectivity between how am I going to invest in resilience, you're not going to have ever resilient or sustainable business model in the long term. Um, so that is why it's also really fascinating. And I do appreciate this opportunity to look at the big picture, to look at those macro trends that are impacting all of us, society as a whole. Yeah, no, I, think, I think there's four things really the insurance industry does and can continue to do and develop. So one of them is about risk transfer. That's Everyone's familiar with that. You can buy insurance and you can transfer the risks off your balance sheet, whether it's your personal balance sheet or a, a business balance sheet. Uh, and even in municipals can, can transfer those risks to, to an insurer's balance sheet. And it really is a, a fantastic approach. You know, sharing the risks of the few amongst the many works extremely well. And, it, and it's been the bulwark of stability in, uh, in societies or developed societies for the last uh, 150 years ever since sort of life insurance became popular. So if your main breadwinner in your family died, it wasn't that you were destitute on the street, or if your house burnt down, that, that, that you weren't destitute. So, so that's number one. Number two is we're very big investors. Uh, so we do have an influence in the investing world. And now the investment universe is huge, but we do have an influence as institutional investors and as asset owners. So I think that's the, the second piece. The third piece is we have an accumulation, incredible accumulation of knowledge uh, as Carolina was saying, about risk and risk management. And so we can provide a lot of risk management advice. And so it's not all about transferring risk to somebody else financially. It's about how do you manage risk? And I gave some of those practical examples earlier about you know, building flood defenses and so on. Uh, and in fact, the whole adaptation agenda at, a, a, at the COP process has come right to the fore. And we saw last year uh, the, um, the Global Shield Agreement uh, really is all part of loss and damage of trying to guide countries, especially developing countries and emerging markets, to, to use the modeling capabilities that exist in the insurance industry to do better analysis and, and better uh, prediction of where natural catastrophes like floods and droughts will be and how to protect uh, vulnerable populations. And then the very last thing is, we're a significant enough population and through our uh, collaboration and, and partnerships with the World Economic Forum, we do have uh, an opportunity to influence policy uh, with uh, both business and uh, uh, political decision makers. And I think that's really, really helpful. And we're beginning to see more, as Carolina was saying, that these leaders, both business and political leaders, are coming to the insurance industry asking for risk management advice. Thank you, John. I think we have last question, so a gentleman right behind, yes, here. Hello, uh, Damien McElroy from The National. Um, we've now had 26 attacks on Red Sea traffic since November. How do you see the crisis playing out? Wish we had a crystal ball. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think we ex can expect it to continue. Uh, I mean, of course, we don't know, but there are, there are no signs for it to, to calm down. Uh, I mean, the question is really, how do we 
support the global shipping industry in addressing this and, and potentially uh, address, um, identify alternatives. Because as a matter of fact, it, we, it, it's becoming almost impossible uh, taking uh, sh container ships now through the Suez Canal without risking the lives of, uh, of the crew uh, and without putting them in harm's way. And of course, that is a critical uh, point because it's not only about um, protecting a big ship or protecting the containers, but first and foremost, of course, it's the, the human lives uh, at risk. <coughs> It is also becoming increasingly difficult because it's difficult to find an insurer that is willing to take risk <laughs> on a ship that is moving through that, uh, that canal as well, the pathway. And then of course the, the jury is still out on whether or not this is uh, state supported. I mean, these rebels have access to military grade missiles and drones that we haven't seen before in these kind of situations. So, and that of course is also an indication that it might be something that is actually it might play out in, in, in a longer uh, horizon than we might have initially anticipated. It's almost like sanctions on Europe. Thank you, Carolina. Before I close, uh, Sadi, anything else you would like to mention that you think that we haven't addressed uh, today? Yeah, I think um, one, please take a look at um, the report and especially some of the under the radar risks. I think um, what we try to do is get some of the experts to analyze for us what they think will be um, the most um, complex risks for the world, the most severe risks for the world. But there are risks at towards the bottom of the rankings that are also incredibly important. And we actually tried to analyze one of those under the radar risks this year in the longer term outlook. Could we be looking at a situation where that um, toxic mix of um, the rise of um, uh, uh, negative um, artificial intelligence use combined with economic hardship, um, combined with the distress that comes from climate change, Together, what does that lead to in terms of a rise of criminality? So those are the kinds of things we were also examining in the report. So, so please do take a look at that. And then I think this, the second point would just be that this is an outlook. Yes, it's a very gloomy outlook, but by no means is it a hard, fast, set prediction of the future. The future is very much in our hands. Yes, there are structural shifts underway, but most of these things are very much in the hands of decision makers across different stakeholders. And that's where the effort really needs to be. This should not be seen as a crystal ball. Thank you, Sadia. So uh, you mentioned uh, risk mitigation is about uh, a lot about collaboration. As you all know, we're going to be in Davos next week. And this is where we bring the stakeholders together to discuss this risk and to discuss how to address the key challenges for the world. So uh, tune in on weforum.org next week and um, wish you a nice rest of the day. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, Jan.